Here I am, folks. Uh, I'm here at Ground Zero. I'm fixing to go out and uh, change my cameras, change the cars, hopefully see that we have some more evidence. Uh, this is going to be one of them days. It's going to be a bittersweet day because I can tell already that I am uh, a little late. We've had quite a bit of rain, and uh, I stopped at one of my places first and uh, just to look on the side of the road and came down here. Right when I got here, I'm going to show you right here is about a, what remains of a 13 and a half, 14 inch track, if you can see it. Um, again, like I said, the rain, he's got to it before I have. Here's possibly another indention of the footprint, which I'm sure it's another footprint right here. It's a place where they tend to cross. I showed you all this in an early, earlier video. And before I go down to my place, I'm going to do what I normally do. Guy Howdy, and welcome back to another exciting episode of World Bigfoot Radio. Exactly. The, the generalization, the general characteristics seem to be the same, but then there's other characteristics that are coming out that people are telling that are credible people that, you know, you're like, golly, you know, that doesn't sound anything like this one that, that John over here told me about or that, that Mary told me about or that I've seen here. And so I, uh, it is, it only makes good sense that they are a, a different species as you go across the, the country there. Even the white-tailed deer down here uh, in Arkansas, where I live, if you're um, down here and you kill a deer that weighs 180 pounds, you killed a big deer. Well, man, up there in Michigan, Wisconsin, Montana, where you live, the deer, 240, 250 pounds, it's nothing. And that's within the species. So, you know, there's variance and, and nature kind of takes care of that as far as for, you know, what their physical needs are going to be and everything. So I'm, I'm really sure that it's a different species and I hope, uh, one day to, to be able to prove that I've, I've gotten, as I said, I can compare some of the pictures that I've sent with you. And you can see the one of them appears to be a little albino. One of them doesn't have hardly any hair on his face. Some of them have the snouts. Down here in, in Arkansas, I've never seen, and as far as Texas can of Falk, Arkansas, I'm sorry, the, except this one that I got back here the first weekend in April that's ever had a, I mean in May, I'm sorry, March, <laughs> I'll get it there in a minute, um, in March there that actually has a snout. So, uh, so it's really, uh, it's, it's really intriguing and that's something that I'm kind of looking at and you're seeing now some, some uh, differences in the foot structure, as you said, the three toe and the four toe, and whereas I didn't believe it before, now I'm pretty well locked in. Yeah, these folks were, were telling me the truth. It's a, it's a three toed animal. Yeah. Yeah. When you're seeing multiple examples of it from individuals, different sizes, no doubt there's a breeding population. Sure. You know, it's not yep. just one individual that's malformed. There's more than one of them. But again, there's, you know, we're getting uh, the same thing with uh, the, the visual indicators of distinct subspecies and some of them in areas that are like really close to each other. And apparently they don't breed with each other because they're staying distinct subspecies. So just like you've got uh, elk, whitetail, blacktail, mule deer and moose here in Montana, there's some states that seem to have different variations of uh, sub varieties of Bigfoot living in the same state. They might even be relatively close distance. And the one you just brought up, the, the uh, things with a, sn a short snout on them, kind of a bulldog face that ain't a dog, man. That's a type three Bigfoot. And you get reports of those, the Gugwe type from all right. over the continent. That's mostly from the north. 
There's a lot right. of them up in Canada and Alaska, uh, up in the northeastern states, and the uh, the name we use to designate them, Gugwe, actually comes from the Penobscot Pasmaquoddy Confederation, the Micmac Confederation. They're the ones that named it. So, you know, this is like about as far across the continent as you can get in the, right. in the, in the opposite direction where you are. They're, they have all legends from hundreds of years ago about the same same critter. You know, we have a lot of Indian tribes down here, Native Americans uh, that we have. That, and each one of them, as, as you just said, you know, the same, they have a description. They have their own name. They all acknowledge the creature as, as being just a part of their everyday existence. You know, so, so it does make sense that they would, you know, that if they've either migrated or whether they were here. Well, you the know, real during, clue for me, br brother, is when, uh, you know, um, what, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the lady. She did a, a book with, she's involved with the uh, Department of the Interior, making sure that like um, native uh, sites don't get destroyed and stuff like that. So she's in contact with all the different tribes across the continent in the course of doing this. Um, Kathy Strain. In the uh, process of doing all this, uh, she has been cataloging what each tribe calls Bigfoot. So that's one thing you can point to. It's like every tribe in North America has a name for Bigfoot. But interestingly, some of these tribes have more than one kind of boogeyman running around the woods with different names. And some of them have quite a few, like the tribes up in northern Minnesota and southern Canada and that area, there's five different kinds of bipedal cryptids that you don't want to run into. Bigfoot's only one of them. <laughs> so that's what made me start going, well, wait a minute. If it's just Bigfoot, why does this tribe have two names for apparently different things that are similar but not the same thing? Or three names for it, you know, or more names than that. And then you start looking at what the name actually translates to. And sometimes you can get information on them. Well, what's the difference between this and that? And they'll tell you. Um, no doubt in my mind that there's some other sub varieties of these things running around and some of them are, you know, thankfully probably not very plentiful, but they're pretty damn hostile. So it's a good thing there aren't very many of them. You can look at the totem poles and you see the animals that, that, that they have carved on their totem poles are not the very same. They, they're doing a Bigfoot type animal, but it's not the same. And, and those guys were good with their woodworks. I mean, so like you said, they've got two different names. And in saying that, I sent you some pictures there. Uh, I talked last time when you and I were there about a Bigfoot that we have that appears to have horns. I sent you some pictures there and hopefully they showed up. Also now, is this what you think they call the uh, the howler down in that area? Yeah, uh, the Ozark howler, exactly. <clears throat> I, have I, th I, I think I mentioned this to you, but another person has been a guest on my, my show, Jerry Klein, he uh, got pictures, I believe, of the game cam of a juvenile with like um, nubbins on its forehead, like it, <laughs> yeah, like it was gonna grow horns or something. Exactly. I seen a picture there uh, of, of some four horned sheep. My buddy, a guy I went to school with, actually developed this sheep. This sheep doesn't occur in nature. And he, his, uh, he owned a game ranch, and so he had these four horned sheep. It would cost you $10,000 to kill one of these sheep. Also, I sent stuff from Newspaper Rock up there uh, of some of the, uh, the sightings, that the, the uh, pictographs that the Native Americans have drawn. And you can see horns on these animals, and they're Bigfoot. It's not a bear that they're drawing. So this thing, the Ozark Howler, which is a, a occurs here around the Washita's, it is a Bigfoot, and most everybody who has seen it claims it has horns. And so, uh, like I said last time, I know some some people thought, well, that just sounds too nutty. Well, I, it, here I am out here chasing an eight foot, nine foot animal that I didn't think existed yet. Sounded nutty at first until you have your first encounter. So I've got this thing and got him on camera and. Uh, with those pictures there, when you zoom up on those pictures, you can actually see the iris in the pupil, you know, right there in those pictures. And then you see the horns growing out of the side of his head. I've gone through and traced it with uh, uh, under different filters and it everything filters up as, an, as part of being an animate object of that animal, part of that animal, not just being trees or brush or anything like that. So, uh, so that's really, uh, again, the Ozark Howler and that may be another kind of Bigfoot. It's more of a mountain type Bigfoot. We don't have that. We don't have that report down here in Texarkana, which is, uh, you know, probably 300 miles south of where that starts. But once you start getting around Russellville, Arkansas and Harrison and then up into Missouri, then you start getting those accounts of the Ozark Howler. So so that's another example. So uh, 
as I said, hopefully those, uh, I know there's a transition from the game cameras to the phone to the computer, but hopefully that shows up. And if you look at that, you can see that, that there's the evidence right there along with what my buddy did with the, the sheep. And then, uh, and then <laughs> you need to skip the phone in the middle and go right from game cam to computer. That'll help a lot. <laughs> I'm getting better. I'm not really computer illiterate as such. I'm 60 years old and I, I figure there's no sense in cluttering up my life any more than what it is, but I'm seeing now the necessity of having to do yeah. this. Matter of fact, on this show, I think I, I sent you, I was able to actually email you some things. Normally I'm not very good at that as well, but, but I, that's what I'm fixing to do. I'm fixing to expand my, um, expand my horizons. It takes a little bit of money, you know, to do uh, some people mentioned, they had some great ideas. Some of your, your listeners sent some ideas that were great, you know, as far as for a, a putting some kind of a GPS tracker, but the thing is, right now, I had to retire with an auto accident. So uh, the, the money that I used to have to just spend, and my wife uh, has had to go to Germany to have four discs put in her back. So the, the extra money I had to Bigfoot hunt now has to go towards the uh, household and everything else. So I can't necessarily have to really save to put in some of these projects like that. So, uh, but, but man, just the people had some really good uh, ideas. Um, again, uh, and I want to thank all those people who commented. One guy's. When I was talking about one of my places, he said, that sounds like somewhere around the Little Missouri River. Man, he was right on. Uh, and, and, you know, just by, and very astute of him to to take that and to be able to discern from that. And right there uh, this year uh, at Deer Camp, I walked out behind Deer Camp. I didn't get to hunt much. We're remodeling our house. But the first day of Deer Camp that I get up there and get to go look, I walk out behind my camp. And then there's there's three tracks right in the middle of the road. Went back three weeks ago, and there's like five tracks out there, and they're all from five different animals. They're not the same animal, so uh, so it's been uh, one of those things that, and they don't look the same. So it's possible that even the species within the species there. So I'm guessing that what they're calling the howler and what you got of that game cam is probably what other people are calling the goat man. Okay, the goat man, exactly right, the goat man. And man, that, I watched that on one of those TV shows, Duke, and I thought these people have lost their mind. But then I remembered. You know, well, that's what they said about me. And I remember how much that hurt and how angered I was. And so I, I kind of started having an open mind. But then uh, until you then you get one on ca game camera and you filter that up and you see that horn and you're like, oh, my gosh, you know, because they're both there's horns coming out of both sides of the head right there. It's not just one side. It's not a stick. It's actually where there's horns growing out of this thing's head. And you look at that newspaper rock and the ones the Indians drew. Uh, the Native Americans put up there and put it on their pictographs, and and man, it's just it's 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 a real animal. It may not be as common, but uh, if you read the reports of the Ozark howler, uh, you'll you'll find that it has the horns, and I believe that's what that is right there, because that's actually not too far from the Ozarks and the Ouachita Mountains. And to to think that that thing could have migrated down that far towards where we are, we're not too far from the Arkansas Oklahoma border up there, but to think that that thing could have migrated that far is is not a stretch. No. at all well and the other thing is they follow the mountain ranges and stuff like that too we've had um reports of the uh, type fours which are normally like supposedly arctic or something as far south right. as like down into kentucky right <clears throat> so they can yeah if there's a big open wayfair for them with no humans to get in the way they can go all over the damn place and Kentucky, as you mentioned, they're around Red River Gorge, especially. You know, what a lot of people don't know was Daniel Boone supposedly killed what he called a Yahoo. It was yep. about 10 foot tall. They're in Kentucky. You read all these reports or watch, there's one particular TV show I watch, and a lot of their. Um, the part they always forget about him killing that Yahoo is that he brought it into town and showed it to everybody. That's right. People. That's exactly right. <clears throat> you know, and, and did the thing, was that the only one in there? Well, Again, uh, follow him no. in the same line as Fowl. There had to be a breeding population for that thing to uh, to to be um, there living in Kentucky. So speaking of that, I sent you the picture there. Um, I hope folks can see that the, uh, we have a picture of a mother and a baby walking by our game cam. Now, some people say, oh, well, that's a, a cutout. No, it's not. I said, what we had there, this is where the trail had been bulldozed. And so we had to move our cameras and when we did, about look like probably according to the the timestamp on there, about probably about six forty five or six fifty that morning. Here she comes, crossing the road, and she walks by our game cam. She's got this baby on her left shoulder, and she's really heavy. I mean, I don't know if she could be pregnant or whatever it is, but we found the track 
of this baby is I've got, got it casted. It's about three and a half inches long. But you see her stepping over these these piles of logs. She had had to change the way that she migrated to and from the woods. So there, again, as far as people wanting scientific evidence, well, there's your evidence right there that you've got a breeding population. You're Unless it's what's called oogenesis, where the, the egg you know divides on its own becomes an, uh, and becomes another uh, organism, then it's good that we've got a breeding population. And so there's two parts of scientific evidence right there that uh, that shows that hey this is a scientific creature it's not anybody's it might be some people's imaginations but it's not those of us who people spend time out in the woods the ones whose lives have been affected the ones who can't go to sleep at night and without the windows being totally covered or who don't walk outside to even feed their dogs they have a pistol strapped on their hip the, when you see those kind of people and when they recount to you those stories, when tears form in their eyes and they get the shakes, you know something has happened to them. Yeah, something for real. Exactly. And that, that female with the baby on her shoulder, man, she's as wide as a barn. She's like she, she be huge. She's she huge. And the thing is, she's not, that picture is probably, oh, probably 25 feet uh, from where my camera is. And I, I'm, uh, so uh, I went to see how big she was. I said either she's pregnant again or that could be, you know, baby fat. I don't know that much about it yet. You know, none of us do. But to find that, man, that's probably my greatest, uh, mine and Stephen's greatest find right there. Stephen uh, was, we've been, has been there with me doing the camera shots. Uh, I said, Randy, uh, like I say, he goes with me, man. He's not, he's not afraid of nothing. You know, he will, he'll march right up through them woods knowing, hey, you know, if we meet this thing and mama with a baby, you don't know how things are going to act. But uh, but anyway, to have this and to see that right there, I mean, like I said, I blew it up into a picture and uh, into a poster, I mean, and I've got the poster there at my house. And uh, that's one thing that I'm, I'm proud of, and I think Stephen is too, to be able to take and to show that with everybody. So, hey, man, here's here's mama and a baby. I don't know where the other one is, but like you said, she's huge. She looks like she'll weigh 600 pounds or more. Yeah. And, this one I saw the other day there on, on March the 1st, man, I guarantee you that dude was seven or 800 pounds. And and you hear people talk about, well, that dude was probably 300 pounds. You know, Duke, like I said before, I'm 280 pounds. I'm six foot two. I used to, to bodybuild. And uh, and so I still carry some of the, the weight from bodybuilding. But, but if you look at these basketball players that are seven foot tall, they'll weigh always over 300 pounds just about because the, the – Oh, yeah. The skeleton. I'm not even that stoutly built. I'm uh, what – Five ten and a half and weigh two forty. Right. So 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 to say three hundred pounds, you know, and, and no, uh, they're severely and they're wanting to be remain credible. I understand that if if they tell you they saw something look like five hundred pounds, people are going to laugh at them like what they've done with you and I all their lives. But they're trying to be credible. But they're so severely underestimating just how big those creatures are. Uh, like I said, she looks like I promise you, she looks like she's six hundred pounds, and that that photo is not retouched. All I did was put it on my game cam. I mean, uh, take the SD card and then put it into the card reader and then put it up on the computer and attach it to my phone there and then, and then send it to you. And uh, so, uh, again, uh, we we knew she was there. We knew the baby was there. But then when we found the track and I took one of my friends with me who was a skeptic. And whenever I found the baby track that day, he wasn't a skeptic anymore. He goes, what can you say? I really, what can you say? Yeah. You know, and so... Uh, and, and that pretty well said it all. Well, that's so, one thing that's been very common for decades now. You can go back and look at the early earliest Bigfoot shows going back into the 70s and everything. And they always get, oh, this thing was like eight or nine feet tall. It must have weighed, you know, all of 400 pounds. It was built like a bean pole if it was nine feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You, yeah, you could hold them by the ankles and use them for getting balls out of the sewer without taking the grating <laughs> apart, you know. Um, yep. So this is not an accurate description of a Bigfoot. And the problem here is that most people have no idea how big animals get and how much they weigh. Like even an elk can be like 1,200 pounds, okay? Exactly. So, <laughs> you know, and Bigfoot get freaking bigger than they do. Uh, I, you know, I was just talking to Kevin about this, and he's, uh, uh, you know, saw a Bigfoot that's 14 and a half feet tall is his guesstimate, 26-inch long foot. Well, we've got a body shape, height, and weight guesstimation chart we've been using for years. And all you need to do know is roughly how tall are they, what's their body build like. Go look at the chart. It's going to give you a pretty damn accurate guess. So, That's yes, right. people are very often underestimating. Even at like eight feet tall, they're probably like eight, nine hundred pounds. That's, that's exactly right. So it's we severely underestimate, and I think it's because 
that we want to appear cre- – we're tired of people calling us crazy. And we're trying to appear credible so to put it within a range that people will believe, and even then they don't believe. But if you tell them the thing is, is 800, 900 – I've seen a nine – I've seen two nine-footers. It's the biggest that I've seen. One of them we uh, actually got to put a meter stick on him. He was about nine and a half foot. I guarantee you he weighed a thousand pounds. He was yeah. just massive. Uh, the width of the shoulder width was about four foot. Um, I've got a picture sent to you uh, right there. I hope it uh, showed up there that I got just this week. And you can see Bigfoot and he's hiding behind the tree. And you see shoulders on both sides of this big tree. You can see hair on the shoulder, hair on the leg. And then you can see the hair from the arm on the other side of the tree. Said so if, if it if it filtered up, uh, I had Mary work with me on it, and if it filtered up, because she saw it immediately, it just blew my mind. So these things are just, uh, like I said, when, the, when you've got shoulders that stick out on both sides of the tree and they're trying to hide, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty well uh, tells you what you're dealing with there. Yeah, they're, they're fairly large. Sometimes they forget they have to turn sideways. Well, one thing I, uh, I like to joke around with uh, about other researchers, because most of them have all encountered this, where they want to break up the silhouette of their face all the time. They'll put a hand over their face, they'll pull a branch over their face, anything like it. It's like playing peekaboo with a little kid. When they have their hand well, over their face, they think you can't see them either, you know? That's exactly right. I, it was reinforced to me just how much they like to hide. Um, with to this one I saw there in March the 1st whenever uh, I, I came through there and then he was ducked down behind the root system and uh, of that tree and I showed you the root system and like I said he's just you he can't even hide himself but he thinks he's hit uh, again that nine footer that was or nine and a half footer that was behind the tree and shoulders sticking out both sides that need need they have to hide I have one there uh, that I sent you a picture and it looks to be the dog man variety and you can see He's kind of laying on his back or his side, and he's reaching forward underneath these two logs that we've put the candy bars between. You can see the sharpness of his nails in his hand, and his eye is looking at you over this log right there. And he is trying not to have his picture taken, but he's not going to give up on that Snickers bar. And so it's hilarious, And but to filter it up, and it looks kind of like it might be of the dog man variety. He's got a snout. Uh, you see the hair very, very clearly. And I also sent you one that I got this week, which is one of the, probably one of the coolest things I've ever gotten. I've got one here that appears to be a young juvenile, but he's big. He's probably in the, at least the, the, the five to seven foot class, but I've got him on my game cam and I start seeing something as on the game cam start walking towards the camera. And at first it's just kind of blurry, but I'm thinking, well, that's a cloud or that's condensation. Well, then all of a sudden you look and you can see, and then there's his hand. He's laid down behind the log where the candy bar is. He's reaching his hand around trying to get the other Snickers bar that I put just in front of the camera. Also, whenever he gets through, the funny part is he turns the camera straight up towards the sky. So every picture I get after that, not on it. But he's trying to hide his face. His face is not, uh, Duke, it's not three and a half feet away. And he's got his face kind of looking down. Like you said, he thinks if his eyes are hid, then he's fine. But you can see this and you can see the hair on this animal. You can see the face. You can see the brow ridge. You see the dark black eyes, but still. And he's laying down. And we, Stephen and I actually found the, if you've heard of the skookum cast, uh, yeah. what looked like in the ground, like what would have been a skookum cast where something had laid down there. There were the tracks and everything. And we couldn't figure it up and couldn't figure out what it was until I got home and got that filtered up. And I called Steve and I said, oh, man, you're not going to believe this. And so sure enough, there he there he is. And then uh, again, that picture there I sent to you, I hope it shows um, it, what has happened there. But if it doesn't, I'm telling you again, as a rule, as fact, because he's walking up there and he hides and he's uh, trying to get those candy bars out of there. And the fact that he's getting his picture took is not going to keep him from getting that Snickers bar, kind of like some of these little kids that we have around here. Right. But but that need to be hid. I mean, he's la- where we found the ground. He's laying down. Here I am, folks. Uh, I'm here at ground zero. I'm fixing to go out and uh, change my cameras, change the cars, hopefully see that we have some more evidence. Uh, this is going to be one of them days. It's going to be a bittersweet day because I can tell already that I am uh, a little late. We've had quite a bit of rain and uh, I stopped at one of my places first and uh, just to look on the side of the road and came down here. Right when I got here, I'm going to show you right here is about a, what remains of a 13 and a half, 14 inch track. 
if you can see it. Um, again, like I said, the rain has got to it before I have. Here's possibly another indention of the footprint, which I'm sure it's another footprint right here. It's a place where they tend to cross. I showed you all this in an early, earlier video. And before I go down to my place, I'm going to do what I normally do before I go down. I stop and try to make a call. I have here what's a little megaphone. You can see it right here. That's Boggy Creek. I did this some work with Chester Moore and uh, got some of these printed up for the kids that we had. And this is just a below dollar fifty two dollar megaphone. But man, it really amplifies your voice. And before I get started here. Uh, the next sound you're going to hear is going to be me doing a, a barred owl type call and a barred owl, what I call a whale. And, but it tends to work quite often. So I'm, what you're going to hear is me. And then we're going to walk down to the place where I actually had that Bigfoot sighting and kind of let you know what was what went on down there. So this will be me doing my barred owl call to let them know that I'm here. Folks, that was me, good or bad, if you're through laughing um, at what it sounds. It that may sound but kind of crazy, but it may be the love call to a Bigfoot. But we're fixing to walk down to the woods here. I thought you might appreciate that. And seed, like I said, this little thing cost me like a, two bucks to have it printed up. And uh, so, uh, but like I said, it doesn't have to be expensive. Here I am. I'm down here at, at Ground Zero West. And uh, this is where what has been happening, what I've laughingly called the the great camera caper um not long ago and i think you'll see on this this show here that we have here for you i captured a bigfoot right here on this stump you can see my camera right here i hope you can see my camera right there and he came up and he laid down behind this stump to get the candy bar away And when it did, it got his uh, got his picture taken. So what was funny was when we came back up here the next week. Then here we are. Here's the other camera that we have spying on this guy. And so uh, if you miss him on one camera, hopefully you'll get him on the second one. Well, here we are with the second one. And whenever my buddy Stephen, my Bigfoot hunting partner, came up here, this camera was covered up with a piece of bark. So we had a big laugh out of it. We reset our cameras, we come back a couple times during the week. We come back the next weekend. Steven seems to have the lucky charm in his pocket because we come back the next weekend and this camera right here that you can see is covered up with a piece of bark. see the big piece of bark laying right there beside it that he had covered it up with we just left it there hoping it might you know bring something to bring him in but the funny part about it i came back up here tuesday and when i was up here tuesday you're going to see a picture there's something that has thrown a gold looks like a metal ball in front of my camera For whatever reason, you can tell it's suspended in midair. It's as though it's been done to uh, set the, trip these cameras off so that it might be safe for the Bigfoot to see if it's actually working or see if it's safe for him to walk. So it's kind of weird, but this is where it goes on. Here's the rest of my trail. I've got a game cam right down here that has a uh, that, that takes photos and takes movies. So hopefully we'll have something on it, and then we're going to continue on here a minute and go on down there to where uh, I got the Bigfoot sighting the other day to be interesting is that they think that if you see part of their body you probably don't see them but if you see their face you see them for sure and that's right. very telling because it's either they have observed us so much that they realize that we key in on faces i mean that's what pareidolia is all about it's our brain right. trying to make a face out of something that isn't even a face and isn't there exactly and is it because they've studied us that much or is it because they do the same damn thing I, 
you know, I, I'm with you. I would tend to think that it's because uh, they do the same thing. You know, it, how close they are to being a relative of ours, I don't know, but I know that they're the smartest animal I've ever dealt with. Uh, you and I have discussed uh, how some of the things they do that they just make you look foolish sometimes, and all you can do is just laugh. You know, yeah. but I think that they they're 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 so visually oriented. They do the same way. Their their facial things they. If they hide their face, then they're okay. I bass fish uh, and uh, fish a lot of tournaments. If you catch a bass, say, in, in grass or lily pads, and you pull him in, that bass is calm if his eyes are covered with the grass and stuff. As soon as you pull that grass away from his eyes, man, that fish goes nuts. Well, I think they do the very same thing. When when he's got his eyes covered, he thinks he's okay. And then uh, as soon as he realizes he's being looked at or that light, Boy, he just it makes a big difference. We had and two examples of that on the show here recently. One is uh, Robin McRae sent a picture where there was one standing sort of in a bush observing him, and as they walked by with the camera, he realized the camera was on him and put his hand up over his face. And he's like, you can see most of them standing there with his hand over his face. And you're like, what the hell are you even bothering to do that for? You're out in the open. And then uh, another one that Kevin got accidentally was about 25 feet up a tree. And he was just walking along filming these uh, treetops and over the edge of this ravine and he didn't even see it. I caught it on there. It was only on there for about a third of a second. But it's a juvenile up in the tree and as the camera goes across him, he's got his hand over his face and his nose to break up the outline of his face. Even though he's <laughs> up in a tree hanging on. Uh oh, human with camera, quick, you cover your face. You know, you know I, I mentioned uh, on our our last show there how even with the uh, infrared i saw one on FLIR. and when that infrared hits them man i mean they just they know instantly and, and they tend to seem like they react kind of uh angrily to that but people say well why why you don't get them on game camera i think that's one reason these with the infrared i don't get nearly as many uh actually don't get anything that, that's as credible as i do the still pictures whenever i have the the moving camera type i think they can see the light and i think they can hear it but when I put just the regular game cam out and actually hide it in a bush, I don't put it on the side of a tree so it looks, you know, unnatural or anything else. I hide it in a bush or hide it in those sticks and stuff. And and that's one reason they can throw my game cam. I'm not mounting it down. But uh, but all of a sudden, they, <laughs> well, then they, you know, then then they, they don't have the usual uh, uh, tendency to avoid those game cams like that. Then all of a sudden, then they accidentally get caught, you know, which is I've got a picture there that I sent you. It's one that you can see him looking at you. He's got his left arm stretched out. He's right there on what Steve and I call the candy store. It was the two logs where we put all the the, uh, the bait there and stuff. And you can see the hand reached out. You can see the big face. He's got a little snout. Uh, you see the cone-shaped head. You see the hair. You see the arm outstretched. You see the, the fist closed up. You see the black nails. But then there that dude is, and we had two cameras set up. Well, he walked by that other camera. And it didn't go off for some reason, I guess, whether it was the, the things that they do to blow all your electronic equipment or whether it was just an ordinary malfunction. But then whenever he walked up there in front of where my camera sat and he sat down to get that candy bar and got his picture right there. And so I've sent that to you. Again, that's four foot away. You can't deny that that's a, if it, uh, that it's a big foot. And uh, I mean, it's what you're looking at. It's very clear on my, my, on my, my cell phone and on my game cam. And I hope it, that, that Mary and I were able to filter that up and it, it shows up really, really good because that's about a nine foot animal right there also and he's just massive. I'm down here at ground zero. Uh, today we're, I'm gonna kind of show you how I've got things set up that we were lucky enough to be able to catch that Bigfoot um, on camera last week. And uh, today we got Steven with us over there. I call him the psychedelic Sasquatch with the chartreuse shirt on, but a very, very serious researcher, good researcher. Very fortunate to have him as my partner and as my friend. We've been friends for 31 years. And so uh, anything I ask him to do, uh, Bigfoot related, this place is 50 miles from my house and uh, he's here in a heartbeat. So I'm glad to have him. I'm gonna show you right here. Here we are. I've got two cameras down here to set up. The first camera you can see right there is hidden in a brush top. And this camera is actually spying on another camera that's right down there where you see that brush top right down there. That camera right there, we've been getting most of the activity. So as we're thinking that if we got two cameras on here, if we missed him with one, sure enough, we get him with the other one. And as luck would have it, that's exactly what happened. This camera right here from where I'm standing, where the Bigfoot would have been standing, the camera is about five feet tall. So you'll be seeing right there, it's about five feet from this ground. 
when you see this Sasquatch walk by through here, that Sasquatch, those shoulders are over four feet high. I mean, four feet wide, and uh, he's over nine feet tall. And uh, very rarely do you get it. Uh, I was just dumbfounded at the size, almost nervous because I knew we had some big ones in here. I found some 19 inch tracks. In here, but uh, but when you come in, you actually see what the creature looks like. Um, then, then you realize that just how fortunate you are, number one, that he hasn't decided to come run you out of here, but number two, to actually have his picture. So, but that's what we do. We try to take these cameras. I'm gonna walk you down here to this other one that we have down here and just show you how it's set up to try to catch these Bigfoot when they come through. He generally comes, there's three or four trails right here in the woods right here coming down and they're wide enough for, for me and Steven who are both 280 pounds or better easier for us to walk side by side should we decide to do so but he comes down these trails comes out of the woods you can see how thick it is right now it's only April again you can see our gifting logs there you can see I've already got it baited up with candy bars and my camera is right there so you can see the camera is spying on this other camera right here is being spied on by that camera right there and so uh, we came through here and he just happened to be not paying his attention or I think he's actually used to us I don't think it's a deal of not paying attention at all by the time that that he goes by those cameras in that brush he's already in within the, the camera cone there with what it will shoot so that's how we're doing this right here like I said you can't just put them up on the side of the trees it doesn't look natural I've never had any kind of activity on that at all and uh, coincidentally, most everything we're getting is on the, the still shot game camera. I think they can hear um, when the other camera's buzzing and they can see the light. And that's what's, uh, what I think turns them off in some ways. That is one of the trails you can see going right through here that's just really, really big. And uh, he walks right down the edge of that wood line and comes down when he goes back. To another trail right down there so so here we are folks at ground zero the way it's set up i thought you might find it interesting and kind of give you a little uh, a little insight as to what we're doing and maybe how why we're being fortunate enough to get these animals gone a little bit i'm probably a quarter of a mile away down a little different road um, i'm down here where i've had quite a bit of activity and uh here we are right here Look at this X here that I found. It crosses about nine feet over there at the top, goes behind one tree, is stuck. Here it is at the other tree, stuck. <clears throat> I go a little bit further here. Look here on the ground. There's another X. And right here, here's this tree that's and this way bowed stuck into the ground so we're gonna call this bigfoot right here tim trebo how about that call him malcolm x that seems to be his thing there's one it's the same one i got video from earlier this year that i'd already shared about the time that he tree knocked at me And we're gonna go in here and we're gonna see number two and then there's number three all right here within 35 40 feet uh, in the woods real close to Falk got a pretty neat little find right here it's kind of raining and uh, weather's not too bad I want you to take a look at this man this is a little structure that built by an animal that I call Tim Trebo here. But take a look at this. Again, he's got this woven, bent, pinned over, under, and through and wrapped right around there. That's the tip end of this thing right here. It's a pretty cool 30 to 40 feet right here because I'm going to walk right over here. 
I'm going to show you something else that he's done. And this is really interesting to me because this log right here that you see is suspended perfectly through there. It's not touching down on this end down here. Here he is. Again, Mr. Trebo. He's got the thing pinned down right there. He goes over. Makes your little X right there. Comes from that broken tree, but I want you to see this. This is really cool. Look up here at the top. Look at how that's woven here in the top. And it's broke. And it's wedged through sideways. There's no way in the world that that could have fallen through there like that. It had to be placed. So, again, here's the other side of it. Here's the other side of it. And here's the other side of it right there. So you see that, and there's no way. He has put that up there for, I don't know how he comes up with all this stuff every time, but he manages to completely intrigue you with the things that he does. Look at this. Why well, he has done this right here. Again. Here around this tree. And here, 20 feet away. It's the first structure that I showed you. Again, pretty cool. Well, before we run out of time here, we got a couple other ones we want to talk about. And the one is the... Uh, uh, the little squatchlet that was playing with the trinket pile, rearranging stuff. Man, that has been one of the coolest experiences we've ever had. Uh, my uh, preacher son went with me one day, and I bought him some uh, some little uh, cupcakes there that had the little sparkles on them. Well, he ate the whole pack except for one. He set it down. <laughs> God. So I get back to church on Wednesday night. He goes, man, have you been back up there? I said, no, why? He said, well, I, I left one of my, my cupcakes up there. And, and I, he told me where it was while I went to get it. When I went back, well, I came back, got to church Sunday morning. He goes, you get my cupcake? I said, no, your cupcake was gone. And he said, rats get in? I said, no, your cupcake was gone. You know, something picked it up. So um, Randy Crawford actually picked up on that. He put a few rocks on the stump then, and then we go back, and then the uh, the rocks are rearranged and moved. So um, I kind of just dismissed all that. Like I said, I'm kind of working more with the cameras. Well, Stephen, uh, man, he takes that up as his, as his personal enterprise. So we put marbles. We put Legos. Uh, we put candy bars in there, of course, to keep it there. We put golf balls, kitty cat ball, not all at the same time, but we try to put some stuff up there. And then the little that comes up there and it rearranges them at night. So what we have right there in that picture, you can see this baby Bigfoot. It's a juvenile, and he's over there at what we call this gifting stump. This stump actually extends maybe five inches high above the ground. But so we're putting all our stuff there almost like a table, and he's there rearranging it. Coincidentally, in that picture, we had a lightning flash. You can see the beam coming out from the camera there. It looks like it's evidently ionically charged particles or something like that, but you see the Bigfoot on the side. And so then we filtered it up to where you can actually just see the Bigfoot and you can see him hunkered down over there and he's just having a ball, just rearranging the marbles and, and uh, rearranging the Legos. And, and then we actually put him some peanut butter out there. And uh, we would put the whole bottle of peanut butter <clears throat> and we would come back the next time and the whole bottle would be gone, the jar of peanut butter. We come back three weeks later and the lid would be put back on the stump or the wrapper would be put back on the stump. We would put more peanut butter out there. We'd come back the next time and the peanut butter jar would be gone again. So I don't know how much money Stephen Penn on, spent on peanut butter. He could probably build a new house by now, but we were playing <laughs> that, that thing. But it was the coolest thing. So when uh, they did this bulldozing, the last uh, peanut butter lid that we found, um, we had. So I took it. And I just screwed it on the top of a, a limb there that fit almost about the same size of the jar. I went back two days later, and he's taken that lid from that peanut butter again. And I don't know what he did with it, but one of them. <laughs> or, a we souvenir. So, a souvenir from the good old days of peanut butter. <laughs> we worked so hard, and because uh, my wife would laugh at us, oh, you guys are such great Bigfoot hunters. Did you have your gloves on? Did you have your bags? You know, and of course we were, we weren't expecting it. We were unprepared. So finally, we've got bags. We've got things to pick it up with, and we find the lid. The lid we had been kind of opening a little bit so they could get the smell, and uh, and be sure they messed with it. Well, then we decided not to even open it. We buried it in the ground there by the stump. Just the lid is showing. 
it gets it out of there and it's trying to get the uh, the lid off. And since we didn't unscrew it, he took his teeth like a pop bottle lid and started prying it off. And so whenever it is, sure enough, we find it. We got the, <laughs> the pliers to pick it up. We got the bag to put it in. We got the DNA from his saliva and also his hands. We're all excited. I go put it in a bag well, at the house and I put it in a safe place. I tell my wife, I said, don't mess with this. It's got big for DNA. And of course, it's not cheap to send anything for a DNA analysis. So, oh, I won't. Well, we're doing a remodel. And so she had to clean out the shelves. Well, she forgot what I told her. But sure enough, she comes there, there to me and she's got the uh, baggie in the one hand and she's got the lid in there. She goes, what is this? I said, no, Cindy. I said, that's the Bigfoot lid that he pulled off the candy, the uh, uh, peanut butter. And I said it had DNA on it that was untarnished. Well, of course, we, Stephen, good as he is, he had a big laugh out of that. So did I. But we actually had that. So I still got that. As, and you can see on the sides of each one, there, like I said, where he's kind of took his teeth, pried up on one side, and his mouth is so strong. He was actually able to that hard plastic peanut butter jar lid and actually pry up the edges and pull the peanut butter jar up. So that's been really cool. And, and uh, we kind of got him going now a little bit again. I um, think that one there being a juvenile, um, I, he may have kind of outgrown that and he's not spending as much time at it. But we still get some stuff there every now and then. Uh, but but we're just now uh, starting to put the cameras back. It had been deer season. A lot of people what I call poached on us, you know, they came there and trespassed, even though it's, you know, it's public land, it's not my land, you know, but, but we call them being trespassers. So they're finally coming out of there. So now that we're putting our cameras back and the Bigfoot are starting to show, and I'm hoping this little, little young one will show itself again. Right on. Well, one, uh, speaking of young ones, there's one picture we didn't talk about yet, and that's the one with the little white baby and uh, mom reaching down to grab them. Man, that was a, a really a surprise for me because again that's right at the same place we've got eight different animals from this one place we call the candy store we put the candy between the two logs there and then they in order to get it out they have to stay there in front of the camera a little longer well sure enough we get up there and i'm looking at this i'm like oh no you're not going to believe this well the thing is like his little albino face or else he just hasn't grown all his hair and i don't know how you know at what age they do that but the face is white he's got hold of a, of a stick right there and then you you can see the eyes, you can see the nose, and then you can see Mama's hands. She's reached her hands down there, and she's fixing to pick him up and move him from the the stump because she realizes he's having his picture taken. And so you see both hands coming down there to pick this juvenile up. And so you see the juvenile's hand wrapped around the deal. You see the juvenile himself, and then you see Mama's hands coming in. And uh, I've had people some of the Expert said, oh, well, no, Bigfoot's fingers aren't but five inches long. And I sent an accompanying photo there uh, for folks to take a look at. I watched the one, the very first one I saw as he reached up to uh, get this limb and pull down in front of his face, like what you were saying before. He was actually eating from that thing. But I saw the fingers wrap around. It was like one of those giant base, baseball gloves, a black baseball glove that wrapped around the limb and right. just pulled it down and kept it. So I'm looking at this thing for a good 10 to 15 seconds as he's doing skin the cat. These things aren't five inches long. These fingers are seven and eight inches long. I've got a 14 inch track, I mean a hand track that I took a picture of. And those fingers I've actually got part, I casted it with foam and then stuck it in there. And then the rain came and tore it up. But I, uh, as I pulled it apart, I was able to keep one picture. The finger I've got of that thing's about eight inches long. And I still have that at my house uh, on the board that I use to try to keep it dry. So, uh, and like I said, it's about eight inch fingers. So, so that is actually, like I said, that's actually mama and, and her fingers are different color. Her fingers are a, a black and a brown. And then the baby's is white. And like I said, so I'm assuming it was just, you know, just a little albino things that happens in nature, but you can see that picture. And I think you can see it very well that, uh, that there she is. And, uh, so again, we found a track there about a six inch track, which looks like it might be closer towards fitting that animal as, uh, as what it is on this, this other one. They're not, it's not the same animal at all, but Again, that's one of the many pictures that we got, mama and baby. We got two instances right there, two animals right there, almost in the, in that, or two complete animals almost in the same uh, picture, but we got the two body parts there. So really, really a, a, a great find for us. That's one that's brought us a lot of laughs, you know, because, we, oh, no, well, that's not real. Then you show them those other fingers from that, and they're like, well, I guess that is real. Well, yes, it is real, you know. So, uh, you know, I, as I said, Duke, I'm not out to try to hoax anybody, to, to goof anybody. Uh, I've never made a penny on this stuff, 
and uh, for what we have. And, and I don't do it for the money. I do it because, man, we got an unknown animal out there that is so intelligent that, uh, like I said, he'll play mental chess. When you're looking for him, it's like playing a real-life human Where's Waldo game. Because, man, they yeah. can hide. You're going to get body parts for us. They're not going to just pose in front of the camera. You're going to have to find that body part. You're going to see that eye, that ear, that glint, that finger. You're going to see him. Then all of a sudden, the rest of it's going to come in. So, so that's and then the things that he's going to do there to outsmart you. Uh, wait, 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 wait. They don't pose in front of the camera for you. Well, no, they don't. <laughs> I've tried. I thought about putting enough there. Said, please pose for this camera. But, but uh, so far, I've been having to trick him. You know, like I talked about as far as putting that dummy camera in there. And then putting the, the Snickers bars there and these two logs were really long. They were, they were probably 100 pounds a piece and it took a pretty good little effort to lift. But I put it to where um, there were a couple of knots on there so it wouldn't crush the Snickers. But he was going to have to pick the logs up to get to it. So uh, we've been sitting there trying to um, and that's what it takes to get a picture. You've got to to try to think ahead of them to try to make something other there to where they're going to, you know, where they're going to make that mistake. And uh and so you can get that picture, and that's that was one of those places that we we were very very lucky last year, and we wasn't getting anything this year until I reconstructed it in a kind of a halfway way, and sure enough, it's almost right back to being where it was last year. So I'm hoping to have some more stuff to share with you, if we ever get to have another show, because man, uh, let's see with this dude walking up there and laying down beside it, and like I said, sk- seeing what is the equivalent of, of what they call the skookum cast and, and the hair and the pointed head and the, you can see the brow ridge line. I mean, like I said, and you see the hair off the fingers and reaching around the thing to get it. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, you know, and all you can do is just laugh, you know? And my wife, when she saw it, she, she usually she argues with me. She didn't even argue with me. I said, well, you're going to cause me to have a heart attack. She goes, why? I said, because you're not arguing with me about this and right here. Normally it takes about three days to get her to where she'll, <laughs> she'll agree. Okay. Yeah, I finally see it, but you can see it on this deal. So it's really been, it's been good. And hopefully it's going to continue to be that way. But we're, we're constantly trying to think of ideas. We talk with other Bigfoot researchers. Some people don't want to share information with you. And, and I'm not that way. Steven's not that way. Randy, Shannon. Um, like I said, Mary, Michael, the whole group, uh, Dustin, the group from Southern Bigfoot, it's about sharing. And so we can all learn more about it. And, and so the things, the information we share, you never know when the thing, uh, I'll give you an example. This time, uh, I did that deal at the Keith Crabtree cookout. Well, there was a little boy that was talking about doing a, uh, being in Atlanta state park camping. And the thing came down and was messing around their tent. And of course, everybody looks at him. He's like a little 12 year old kid. And everybody's like, oh, well, he's just crazy. Well, coincidentally, on my phone, I've got a friend of mine who lives in Atlanta, Texas, who who had a game camera out, and he got a picture of that same Bigfoot, and he sends me the picture. L- little did anybody know. Well, sure enough, this boy's talking. You can kind of see people who are kind of scoffing. I said, well, let me show you just to show that you can't ever tell when you share information that that information is going to be what gets you your sighting. And I pulled this thing up, and we're sitting there's about 60 of us sitting around a campfire. And I pull this picture up, and at nighttime, with just the picture on the phone, I mean, it's just beautiful. And I walk around and show the people this this picture of this Bigfoot that's on the game camp. Right there, probably, it's probably not a quarter of a mile from where this boy's talking about. They've had their deal camping. I said, and so here's a case in point. He's sitting there saying it was Atlanta State Park. Here, right here, is proof that this is, he's telling the truth of what's Atlanta. So that's one reason, you know, we try to share information. That's one reason you do your show. Like you do, and, and and have different guests. Man, you've had some great guests on there. But people that are, you know, they're not trying to pull your leg, man. It's, this is, you know, something that they do that's that means a whole lot to them. And if you know, some may make, some of them are monetized, some may not be. The ones who are monetized, it's funny how you can kind of tell because what has you and I said before. All of a sudden, the only face you see on their videos is their own. You know, when you start seeing other guys that are giving you the, the whole video they have is spent looking at the woods, you know, then that's the that's kind of the difference. And so, uh, that's yeah, that's been, my official tip for how you can tell channels that are worth watching from ones you can't on this episode. Thanks for the segue. And that is that, uh, you know, people that are actually doing boots on the ground research and stuff actually have evidence to show you. They don't need to walk around monologuing and showing their face all the time. And people that are just trying to show their face all the time might not be that serious a Bigfoot researcher. I'm reminded of a certain guy over in Utah that used to do that all the time that doesn't even have a channel anymore. And, uh, you know, from what I've heard through the grapevine, he would have done videos on uh, basket weaving or, you know, finger painting or whatever, as long as he could have a video. 
Right. So, you know, some of these guys, uh, they're just in it to try and make a name for themselves, and they're trying to look like they're, you know, experts or they know something or whatever. And I'm not, I'm not saying that the guy I'm alluding to is bad or whatever. He did a great job. It's just like, why did you quit doing it? Well, because you're not getting paid for it. So right. really, you're just in it for the money. You're not in it for the research. And then, and then that's my thing. I don't. I spend more money. This is an expensive hobby. You know, with with gas has come down, thank goodness. But you, if you total up what you spend on soft drinks, on food, on batteries, on the other things there, you know, an average one day trip into the woods can cost you two hundred dollars. It's real easy. You know, so so it's not. So you don't do it for the money. Um, I talked to one guy here who's very, he's very known in the Bigfoot commu- uh, community, and. I asked him, I said, were you making lots of money just messing with him? He goes, man, I don't make enough money barely to, to travel from one show to another. And I said, well, why do you do this? He said, man, because I love it. And that's what we do it for. You know, we do this because we love what we're doing. And uh, we've been blessed enough and fortunate enough to have these experiences that once you, you didn't start out to be a Bigfoot researcher, all of a sudden something happens and you're trying to prove to other people, you're, to yourself actually, that you're not crazy. And then you find more and more stuff and then you realize, hey, man, this is really, this is really I know. Cool. I know a lot of other people are on that page, but interestingly, I'm one of the people that doesn't actually, I never wanted to prove it to other people. Uh I don't, I don't give a crap. I'm doing the research because I want to know how to avoid them. And that (laughs) requires that you have to know a lot about them in order to know how to avoid them. That's my primary concern. And I hope to have enough information that I can explain to other people how to avoid them as well. <laughs> exactly, because, you know, generally when you have an encounter, one thing you don't know, you don't know how long it's going to be, but you generally know who's going to be in it, you know, and if there's any kind of altercation, and you know you're going to be one of the principals. So the same way, so you want to know more about it. Uh, these people that come up with these formulas for this is where the next Bigfoot sighting is going to be. No, the next Bigfoot sighting while this TV show was going on was right going on right here in Arkansas, and I had it. And uh, there was also another guy riding who drives a a, a truck, um, a log truck there in Texas, and uh, he had one step out. He said he thought it was a Clydesdale horse at first until he stopped and saw how big it was. And then whenever he on his log truck, he hit those jake brakes and it, like that right there, and then the thing just stepped back into the woods. Well, he he saw me one day, and then I have a Bigfoot. Um, sticker on the front of my, my license plate and he goes man he, he goes you're a bigfoot hunter and i said yeah he said i see you all the time i said well i appreciate that and he said man let me tell you what happened to me and this was about three miles from where i normally hunt at you know and so so when you have those kind of things and i'm like you do because i said proving it to other people we're not going to convince other people but what i do have i want to share with everybody else and, and right. let them see that say, you can get pictures of bigfoot on a game camera I was very fortunate this year to go to the Texas Bigfoot Research uh, deal down there in uh, Jefferson, Texas, the original Texas Bigfoot Conference. And so uh, as some of the speakers were talking about why you can't get Bigfoot on game camera, one lady, she looked at one of the, the principals there and she goes, well, this guy here can get him. And boy, it kind of embarrassed me because I don't like to brag on myself and I don't like to run to run down other Bigfooters. And so the, one of the guys looked at me and then he's a very famous person. He said, you've got Bigfoot on your, your game camera? I said, yeah. I t- showed him my camera or my phone it was 45 minutes before i got my phone back you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he said he thinks, this is cool you know and uh and so uh, how did you get this how did you get this well then you know sharing some of the same uh examples that i've given to you here of things that we've done you know so they can be gotten on camera and uh so like i said i'm not trying to convince anybody else i know i'm not uh going to convince the ones who want to troll or whatever but uh, i as i did say there's some of your uh the people who commented on, on the last show that we did, man, very astute people on in there. You can tell that they've been following us for a while. They may not have had a sighting, but they're following the right lines, you know, as far as what it takes to do. And that's kind of what what I'm into it for. It's not to convince the, the naysayers as such. It's for people who want to learn and uh, who want to learn about Bigfoot. And, man, I've, I've met some of the greatest people in the world. Um, i got to tell you, the, uh, the listeners and viewers of this show – are some of the sharpest folks out there. I'm continually and constantly impressed by how much they know, how much they're paying attention, and some of the clever ideas they come up with. Oh, I'm yeah. I'm blown away that I've got such a great audience for this show. But I hate to cut you short, brother, but we're way over time here, and i got to go. So we oh, got to cut the show short. And I definitely will be having you back again probably by fall. You'll have so much more evidence piled up, you'll need to do another show anyway. 
Oh, man, I've been very fortunate. Like I said, I've gotten a lot, found a lot of tracks. I've probably found 100 tracks since we did one in October. And then, like I said, I don't say that about me. I stated about the areas close to where I live. I'm very fortunate to have a lot of animals around where I live. And so, uh, again, I thank you for the opportunity to, to do the show. Like I said, the people who listened to it before, to I thank them. Because like you said, man, I better be on my P's and Q's because they're going to call you if you say something, uh, you know, say something that ain't true. They're going to call you out on it. And you better be telling the truth because, you uh, you know, there ain't no such thing as trying to think up a quick, uh, a quick answer to it. And so uh, that's one reason I enjoyed your show. We had last time we had comments, I think, from four different continents, man, which really just um, tickled the heck out of me because I went to Ireland and then uh, I went to Alaska and then I've, I've known some people who've moved to Australia. And then, and then we had some some comments from other people. And so that you, that's one thing that makes your show really good. Like I said, you've got some of the sharpest listeners and such a big cross-reference of people. And so that's why it really means so much for me to be able to do this show with you. And I hope to be back pretty soon. I hope everybody enjoys this. And no, true, as I said, what I said, I'm telling you the truth. I have nothing to to gain from this. And I'm, I'm hoping to have more in, um, evidence to give to you whenever we have another show in a couple of months. Right on. You know, man, neither one of us is getting paid to do this job. We just do it because, you know, hey, it's a fun thing. And and for me, it's, uh, you know, I want, like I said, I want to know as much as I possibly can find out about these guys so I can more successfully avoid them. Right. And, and with that, thanks for coming on the show, William. Thanks all you folks out there for listening in. If anybody is interested in getting some, uh, some nice Bigfoot wear, it's available teesprings uh so go check out my teespring store the link will be up on the screen and until next time everybody remember don't poke dog man with a stick don't punt the puck would you do not flip off the mountain giant avoid trolls and whatever you do do not hug the woogie good night everybody thank you